Welcome back to a number 3D tutorial. Today we're going to talk about the basics of nodes. Now these main nodes that I'm going to talk about are used to add events, to add inputs that are going to trigger different commands and different events in your game. Now let me develop this a little bit more. These main nodes I'm going to show you are basically the building blocks of all games. Most games that you're going to make, or programs for that matter, are going to use these nodes. So let's talk about them. The first thing we're going to do is press Shift A and open up this tab and we're going to select the event um, part here and we can go and grab these three nodes. The first one on init which stands for initialize is basically going to set an event to happen only when you open the program which means it's only going to happen once as soon as you open your program whatever you plug into the output of this initialize node is going to happen if you for example wanted to rotate your cube as soon as the game opens then you just add a rotate node set for the cube and it's going to happen as soon as you open up the game if you instead wanted this to continue in happening every time uh, for forever your cube to constantly rotate instead of just rotate once if you want to have an animation of a cube constantly rotating you wouldn't use the on initialize node instead you'd use the on update node the on update node is essentially the same thing as the on initialize node except instead of happening only when the game is opened it's going to happen every single frame now if you think of a video game like a video, a video is just a sequence of images and each image has a slight variation that looks like movement and if you play them continuously at a certain speed then it looks like the object inside the image is moving when in reality it's just different images, it's just a uh, optical illusion. Video games are exactly the same thing except they're built on commands so you can interact with the image but there are still just a bunch of videos, hap uh, just uh, a bunch of images rotating, causing the illusion of movement and animation. So, an update node is basically going to tell the uh, program to do an action every single frame. And by default nowadays, video games usually have about 60 frames every second, which means there are 60 images happening every single second in your video game. Now th that number can change, you can have up to 120 images happening nowadays uh, on the standard device, but usually 60 seems to be enough. Now an on update node is basically going to say that your action that you defined, for example rotate the cube, like I said on the, on the initialize node, is going to happen every single frame. So that's going to happen 60 times every second. Now that can be a bit excessive and especially when we need to optimize the program or the game uh, to be compatible with as many devices as possible. If you have something that happens 60 times a second that's a lot of computing and calculation needed from the device. Especially when you have a task that doesn't necessarily need to be updated every single frame. So we have another node it's called the on timer. The on timer node is basically the same thing as the on update node. However, we get to define when the event is updated, when the event will take place. For example, if we want to rotate the cube, but we don't want it to rotate every single second, maybe we want it to rotate two times a second. So we'll set that to 0 0.5. Uh, because every second uh, is set to 1 obviously 1 second equal 1 and 0 0.5 is half a second and by setting it to repeat it's going to be the same thing as the on update node but every half a second that is going to optimize your game a lot and it is also going to just work as a game mechanic because not all events need to be updated every second now these are the main building blocks that you can't that your player can't actually interact with directly. This is what the machine is going to use to define what to do with an action. But we do have a lot of things to cover about player related inputs. 
So let's talk about the input section now. Now as you can see there are a lot of different input nodes that you can use. Most of them we're not going to cover in this video but we're going to talk about the main ones. The main ones that you're going to want to use are this one, the keyboard input. Now the keyboard input is, well, it's very obvious. It's going to take any button that is pressed in your keyboard and assign an action to it. For example, rotate the cube when the space button is pressed down. And there we go. That's going to work. So every time you press your space button down, it's going to rotate your cube. However, we do have different options. For example, when our space key is released, as in when we take our finger off from the space button, it's going to do something different. For example, stop rotating the cube. And we also have a different option set as started, so as soon as you hit something on the keyboard, whether it's pressed down or whether it's released, it's going to do the same thing. It's going to do the event. Now we obviously can choose from any single key on our keyboard, that is pretty easy to understand. We can define maybe R started, we're going to do an action. But we also have something important to cover as well. When using a computer, most people don't just use a keyboard. That's right, we use a mouse. So we do have a mouse input right here. Now we have a lot of things to do with the mouse movement and cursor, but we're just going to focus on the mouse right now. As you can see, the mouse itself is very similar to the keyboard. However, there are limited functions because there aren't as many keys on the mouse as there are on the keyboard. We have the middle button, the left button and the right button. But we do have the same functions, however we have an extra one which is set as moved which is pretty easy to understand as in as soon as the mouse is moved up, down, side to side, wherever you want to move it it's going to do an action. Obviously when you set this to moved the left, middle or right button become null and void. They basically don't exist because it's not detecting whether your buttons are pressed down it's only detecting the actual movement that your mouse is making. Now ma when making a game, input are what is going to generate an interactive game and the thing that makes games fun is the interactive part. If you had no control of your game it only really became a video again. Something that you had no control over that you could only spectate and watch. But having these inputs allow you to use uh, well the best of technology and allows you to add interactivity to your actual project. So these main nodes here are going to be your building blocks in the future to making interactivity with your game. You can define whatever action you want to happen when these events are triggered, some obviously triggered by humans, actual players, some are only triggered by the program being launched or being updated. But as I said, these are the main building blocks that you're going to need on your journey to building your first game. But we do have one last input node to talk about before we wrap up the video. And that node is a physics node. Most games rely heavily on physics nowadays. The reason being it's much more fun and we need to have control over what the physics do. So in the physics tab right here we can grab the on volume trigger. Now the reason we talk about the on volume trigger and not any of these many many other physics nodes is because the on volume trigger doesn't actually require physics. Most physics objects in the 3D world require something called a rigid body. However, the function, the on volume trigger, doesn't. Which is why it's very advantageous to use it. So if we select an, uh, the eyedropper icon and then select maybe the cone and then we select the cube you'll notice that we have a bunch of functions for example begin meaning that as soon as our cone begins to overlap with our cube it's going to do something it's going to trigger an event just like all these other nodes however we can change this we can set it to end which basically does the inverse as in as soon as the cube stops colliding with the actual cone it's going to trigger an event 
it's the inverse of the begin. We also have an on overlap, as in when the cube overlaps the actual cone, we have something that's going to happen. But it's a save, it doesn't trigger it as soon as the volume begins to overlap with the cone. It's just a very useful node to be aware of. However, it might not be the most efficient when using actual rigid bodies in your 3D world. That's it for this video. I hope you learned something and enjoyed the learning. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something from using these basic input nodes to begin making your basic game. However, the more complicated games you make, the more you'll realize that these nodes are still visible in all of the professional projects that are around. Because these are, like I said, the building blocks of making games.